Hello there, welcome along to another Mixed Martial Arts Conversation for Sky Sports. We've got a doubleheader Bellator event this coming weekend, live from Connecticut, the early hours of Saturday and Sunday morning, UK time. Chael Sonnen will be there. MMA legend joins us once again. Chael, how are you? Looking forward to the weekend, doubleheader. I'm pumped. I'm fired up, man. We got a world championship on the line. Argeleta and Mix, plus we got uh, Machida and Phil Davis, to your point. Yeah, we got a lot of shows going on. Yeah, let's dig into um, Bellator 245 first of all. The light heavyweight uh, matchup between Phil Davis and Lyoto Machida. What's your, what's your take on this? How excited are you about this matchup? Okay, so this is a rematch. And I know that you know that, but a lot of people have forgotten that. These guys mm. matched up before. And what was very compelling in that fight for me, Machida's the master of controlling space. Uh, if you want to get your hands on him, go right ahead once you get there. But that's the first step, and that's a very hard thing to do. It was actually Phil Davis that was keeping the space. He was kicking Machida with the front kicks. He was getting him in the belly. He was frustrating Machida. Phil Davis might be the only guy I've ever seen frustrate uh, Machida. But for me, the big question, that, fi that fight was laser, uh, razor close. I want to say maybe even a split decision. But it is one of these situations where what did they both learn? And particularly if you're Machida, it always seems like whoever doesn't get their hand raised tends to learn more for right or wrong. But the victor goes, well, I must not have anything to learn. I got the outcome I wanted. So for me, that, that's a little bit of the question. What's going to be different this time? That's for them to answer. Mm. Yeah, because the, the scorecards were really close. A point was the, the most that, that it gave it to Davis, although it was a ultimately unanimous decision. What could Machida do this time, do you feel, Seven years on, will the, will the age work against him in, in terms of the matchup? Well, here's what Machida did right, okay? Phil had a very hard time using that old wrestler versus striker mentality, which largely on paper at the time that they fight is what it was. Machida does a very good job. Wrestlers struggle with it. I struggled with it. Randy Couture struggled with it. Dan Henderson, just to use some mm. – uh, even Phil Davis, who found a way to beat him, struggled to out-wrestle him. It's, just, it's a very hard thing to do. Machida's very good with the knees up the middle. So I offer you that – because he also has some positives that he needs to make sure that he brings back. But he's got to close that space. Machida had I, – I can't really think of another time that was like this where Machida was the one being pushed at bay. Machida is generally the one that decides when a fight starts. And whatever happens there, if you can catch him, you can catch him. But he was the one being pushed away. Phil Davis was the one circling. Phil Davis was the one uh, moving backwards at least – in a higher regard than anybody would have predicted. So the first thing Machida needs to do for a real simple answer, long-winded, but a simple answer, get his hands on him. With Davis, what have you made of his, his evolution since then? You mentioned the wrestling sort of emphasis back then, but how he's perhaps moved to, to more of a stand-up fighter in terms of his variety. Would you expect him to go back to that base in, in this matchup? I would pay Phil this compliment, and it's a very big one, but everybody that comes to this sport gets whipped at some point. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking well, of course you do. Well, not so fast. Phil Davis has never been whipped. There's mm. never been anybody ever that's just thrown him down and controlled him or pounded him out and Phil had no chance or, you know, snapped him down and choked him and everybody goes. So Phil's never been whipped. He's been competitive in every single match he had. A couple of real tight ones with Bader. Even Nemkov, who is now the champion, very tight one there where Phil came on strong, even won. The, th uh, the, the third round after giving away the first. I only offer that for you because as you do look at the evolution of Phil, I do think that he is still very much in his prime. And I do wonder with all athletes, what are you hungry for? What is it you're going after? Is there another championship run or is this just from a competitive love and spirit? Do you have a personal grudge against your opponent? I don't know those answers. I'm going to actually speak with Phil a little bit later today. And I'm going to ask him that very question. What, what is it that continues to drive you? Because don't forget, this guy's been cloaked in success his whole life. This, this is an NCAA collegiate champion. Just by, I mean, this guy's been a winner from day one. What is it he right now is trying to win? Yeah, it's a good question. You mentioned his resume as well, the, the high level he's been in with. Uh, with the light heavyweight division, what do you make of this debate? What is your take on the debate that maybe Bellator's light heavyweight division now that John Jones has moved up from the, the UFC division is competitive is is comparable I thought that Bellator was was very sportsmanlike in that approach they conceded to the greatness of John Jones they conceded that with the absence of John Jones and I'll tell you this about Bellator's light heavyweight division but it's growing I mean they just signed Corey Anderson by example nobody knows who uh, Corey's opponent's going to be there's some very good options out there there was a rumor that it's going to be the winner of Phil Davis uh, versus Lyoto Machida, I tend to mm. believe 
that that rumor is just because the dates match up, but I can tell you there's another signing coming in that hasn't been announced yet. And uh, as far as their, their division, yes, it's great, of course. But it's also growing, and it's getting deeper and deeper, man. It's a hard place to be right now. Yeah. What, do, you, do you think there's, with that depth across the weight divisions, perhaps, there's, there's going to be more calls, particularly in the COVID era with, with finance and issue of maybe cross-promotional fights? We're talking about that in the UK and boxing. Do you, do you see something happening potentially with, with the UFC or Bellator? Is that, is that no, you know, verbatim? No. Not specifically when you say the UFC, no. I, I just don't think they're in a jam right now. In fact, I heard Dana saying kind of the other thing, which is I owe a lot of guys three fights a year. I'm struggling for venues and dates. I'm going to figure this thing out. But, no, I don't think that he's um, looking to do matches like that. Now, Scott Co excuse me, Scott Coker's been very open to the co-promote. He even did a couple of them. He, you know, he had something mm -hmm. going. Uh, it wasn't the Pride guys, but Ryzen. Uh, you know, he's uh, several times um, brought their guys over, sent our guys over there. So, so Scott Coker is open to that idea. So he's never really shared them with me. But um, to your question, as a outsider looking in, I don't think the UFC is looking to team up with anybody. No. What would be your dream matchup if they could or would? Okay, I'm a, I'm still a Fedor Mark. I'm I'm still big, and when he walks in a room, I feel something. I mean, there, there's still a very big presence there, and I'm not alone. And mm. I don't know necessarily that I need to see Fedor with a Stipe type guy, but there, there are guys who I would like to see Fedor with. I mean, there was talk of getting Brock Lesnar, just by example. If you're asking me a dream fight, I can do anything I want. I also think that John Jones versus Fedor is very compelling. John jo uh, you know, Fedor is not an overly big heavyweight. John Jones is worried about his size. I only offer, I think there's a lot of good names, and I think that there's still something special there, at least for me. You asked me the question. Yeah. I like Fedor. <laughs> I like it too. That's, that sounds good. Um, now you mentioned your your last fight magnanimously. You lost to um, Machida. Tell us about him and and those knees in particular. How difficult are they to avoid? Okay, so the knees are always going to be hard to avoid. I mean, knee comes straight up the middle. It's like like any punch. If I do this, you see it coming. If I do this, it's just harder on your eyes. Just that's the way human beings work. He throws the knee very straight, and the knee is a very big problem, particularly if you're a wrestler. Because I'm looking to change elevation. I'm looking to come down anyway. Now all of a sudden I got a car wreck. I got a knee coming up as my head's coming down. It was very challenging for me. But moreover than that was the way he would set these things up. I mean, I just couldn't get that guy to – Machida, stop moving. Give me a mm. chance to win this fight. Give me a chance to touch you. And I, we can all go home ha – whatever happens after that, but just give me a chance. And he would not. It, it was very frustrating. And I can tell you from a heart rate standpoint, it was one of the easier – fights that I had it was just one of those things where I'm looking for this guy but as far as being nervous and never once comfortable do you hey where's this guy I'm not used to this yeah, yeah. man he's different Machida's very different it was for me um what do you think about in terms of the outcome you mentioned the potential matchups for the winner do you see Corey Anderson what, what would be your take on on where this takes the winner I, I would be very interested. I think that they're going to do something big with Corey Anderson. I, I really do. And so when you do talk about where's he going to debut, was it going to be in a main event spot? I tend to lead towards yes. And, you know, when you have main event fighters in that weight class, Machida and uh, Phil Davis certainly come to mind. Coming off wins or like either one of those is a good option. And I know that Corey wants to be fast-tracked, but, you know, when you've got iron on top of iron, sometimes you don't have to be – the guy that's coming in and taking on somebody that's on a two or three fight win streak. There, there's a lot of guys in Bellator right now in a couple of divisions and they can all beat one another. You go look at 155 pounds. There's five, six, seven guys that could beat the champion on any given night. And I think that two of five is that same way. I know that Nemkov has everybody very impressed right now, myself included, but Nemkov is beatable. We have guys that could be, I mean, he's going to have to stay in his game. He's going to use that, have to use that win as a springboard to pick himself up and use that as motivation to train harder because now he's got a bullseye and everybody's looking at him. I only offer that to you because who's Corey Davis going to fight? I think, I think he's got a number of good fights, but I do think that the rumor that he's likely to be matched up with whoever wins between Phil and Machida, I, I tend to believe that rumor personally. Yeah, well, that, that sounds good. On, on the same card, Kat Singano makes a Bellator debut UFC legend, but one and five in a, a last six UFC contest. Are you concerned after a couple of years out with an eye injury about, about her health, or do you feel she'll be 100%? You ever met that girl, Kat Zingano? <laughs> I haven't, no. <laughs> that girl is so cool. I met her. She was, uh, she was like getting paraded around, and they were like the recruiting process. She was talking to a lot of people, and Coker threw his hat in the ring, and we were out in Hawaii, and she trains with Alimale. So she trains, and she was there. 
And that was my first time ever actually visiting with her and being around her. She, that girl was so nice. She might, she might have been the nicest. Maybe nobody's ever treated me as nice as that girl. And I was only around her for about four or five minutes, but she made quite an impression on me. So as far as your question goes, I want to see something good happen to her. You know what? I do. Because she treated me nicely when I was in Hawaii. And I will tell you this, even though she's been out for a period of time, and I do think that that's very fair and very real, and not to mention she's got a pretty tough opponent here, but – she trains with the Lima Lay, and I would like to go back to that because if you're getting rounds in the gym with the greatest fighter in the world, that's a little bit different than just, you know, putting some running shoes on and trying to get some workouts in before your big debut comes back. I, I do expect her to be very sharp. Yeah, I want to see her back healthy and sharp. Of course we do. Looking at her CV as well, Ronda Rousey, Misha Tate, Amanda Nunes, got an incredible record. What about Chris Seibel throwing that into the mix? Do you see that down the line? Potentially, if if all's being well with, with her comeback. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see why not. One, one thing about Cyborg, and it's very real, and the, the sooner the ladies uh, observe it and recognize it, the sooner they can manipulate it and use it in their favor. But the number one person that gets to fight Chris Cyborg over the last 10 years is the first person that raises their hand and says, I'm willing to fight Chris Cyborg. Right now, you know, we got Julia Budd. But Julia Budd, regardless of being a champion in the past, she's the only girl saying, put me in. Some other girls will say yes if they get the call. But Cyborg's a tough night out, and that's a very intimidating proposition, and it's just a reality. She has ran so much fear through so many fellow competitors that if you want to get in there with Cyborg, raise your hand. And I mean, it's like any job interview. If you're the only one that shows up, that you're going to get hired. Mm, yeah, we had the Irish boxer Katie Taylor, her team making noises potentially about, about reaching out for a, a boxing match. We'll see what happens with, with Chris Cyborg. Quickly before you go, Chow, you mentioned Brock Lesnar. I guess it's a, it's a serial saga with him, though. Out of contract, we understand, with WWE. Talk of, of MMA potentially a return for him. How do you see that playing out? If you're Scott Coker, would you, would you make an approach or would you risk being used as a, as a pawn in that negotiation? Well, he's most certainly being used. Will Coker see an advantage to, to getting his own brand and his own name out there? I mean, I mean Coke, nobody's making going to fool out of Scott Coker I can tell you that so Coker will allow himself to be used as much as he wants to be used but yes Brock Lesnar is using us MMA fans and media and pundits as nothing more than ballast we're, we are just simply leveraged for him to go and get a better deal it's very fair game by Brock Lesnar he's an old carny at heart they, they only know a couple of tricks and uh, when they work yeah. they go back to the well and that's what we're seeing and quite frankly I got no problem with it. I really don't. I think that there's some fun there. I think it's silly. If it's worked for him, go right ahead. He can't, you know, you can only go in the boss's office and knock the desk over so many times, but fair play to Brock. Brock's done nothing wrong. It's annoying. I say it's annoying because I like to see Brock. I actually come yeah. from a point of positivity. I'd really like to see Brock, but I'm not going to see him, and I'm not falling for it. That's why I sound <laughs> like I have a chip on my shoulder because I'm not getting my way. That's what I'm upset right? about. Well, maybe, maybe Vince McMahon will watch you there and he'll change his mind about the, uh, the tactics as well. Um, did you, were you ever tempted by WWE or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I looked at that at a period of time. There was a rival company called WCW. And WCW had something called a power plant where you went and trained. That would be what you would think of today for NXT for the WWE. But WCW had a power plant. And I went through that process. And that was in 1998. And I was going to pursue that. I had two years of college left. It was my sophomore, I, junior, senior. So I went back. I finished college. And that's, that's what I would, thought I was going to go and do. WCW went out of business. They closed down. I went into MMA. Yeah, the rest is history. What a career unfolded. Chael, thank you very much. Appreciate your time as well. We've got the technology working as well today. We, we got there. Thank you very much. You're the man. I look forward to talking to you again. See you, buddy.